No other Australian locomotive has captured the public's imagination like the sleek, streamlined 3801. For children, the enthusiast, right through to the retired drivers who worked the 38-class engines in their heyday, the restored 3801 is a classic working example of the great steam train era. First introduced to service in January 1943, 3801 added flair, style and speed to New South Wales Rail Service. The years that followed saw another 29 locomotives of this class enter service. Over a colourful two-decade career, the 38 class set remarkable new standards in steam locomotive performance to become Australia's ultimate express passenger design. Since its restoration to active service in 1986, 3801 has become a legend through its ever-popular public tours. The former Everly Locomotive Workshops in Sydney provides accommodation and shelter for the exacting duty of keeping the train in top condition. It is also home base for 3801 Limited, the company that manages and operates the train. General maintenance through to total rebuilding of carriages is undertaken by volunteers who give their time and talents to better equip the train. In terms of maintenance for the engine, there's always uh, something to do to it, not necessarily a major item, uh, but as, as time permits opportunities arise, we know there's something slightly amiss, not necessarily a major defect by any means, but we'll attend to it, just to keep the engine in as uh, good a condition as we possibly can. The volunteers are primarily uh, enthusiasts from the point of view of they like doing the work, uh, their ultimate reward is, is working as a carriage conductor on one of our trips. The volunteers at times uh, tend to consider it to be their train and probably that's not a bad aspect either. They take pride in what they do and how the thing is presented to the public. At 6.45 a.m. on August 15, 1992, 3801 departed from Sydney's Central Station, beginning a 3,000 kilometre journey from the East Coast to Alice Springs, the red centre of Australia. On board were 175 passengers and crew. For the next 10 days, 3801 would take them on a steam adventure through some of the most diverse scenery and terrain Australia offers from bush green pastures to the stony deserts, dry salt lakes and red dirt of the outback. For the first 39 kilometres, 3801 was assisted by a small black locomotive, 3112, enabling the train to negotiate the steep 1 in 42 grades near Sydney. In terms of or mechanical preparation for the Alice trip, uh, nothing special was done to the engine, nor indeed the carriages, because uh, as far as we were concerned, it was in top condition, uh, certainly more than good enough to do the trip there and back. Everything was just normal. Uh, the Alice Springs trip was just, just another trip, except it was going to be a bit longer and a bit harder. As well as the maintenance side of things, there was the, the logistics to organise and that was uh, carried out by a number of us working as a team with one doing the calculations, uh, another one doing the checking and then of course uh, the ultimate decision as, as to what we would need and the hard work as far as the, the bags of coal were concerned. 
The coal was transported from the Hunter Valley coal fields to Everly Workshop, where it was bagged, loaded into rail wagons, and dispatched across the country to predetermined destinations. In the calculations as to where we needed the coal and how much we needed, it was worked out what bogey wagons would hold and how many bags we needed for this destination, that destination, etc., and where one truck could serve uh, a couple of destinations. Two trucks of coal were sent to Broken Hill, one to Parks, and another taken with the train as it departed Sydney. Some 146 bags of coal were ultimately produced in the shed uh, at a tonne a bag. It turned out we didn't use all of those bags, but it's far better to have too much coal because it was easy enough to bring home, rather than run out on the way, which would have been considerably embarrassing to say the least. Water was also a major consideration. Three travelling tanks, known as water gins, were coupled to the train. Each gin holds 7,000 gallons, but only one needed to be full when leaving Sydney. The three gins were needed for the run from parks across the Broken Hill, which was a distance of some 670 odd kilometres. With our water consumption around Sydney and with the hard slogs, it works out at about 40 gallons of water to the kilometre. So we based uh, the water consumption and indeed the coal consumption on those figures, although we didn't expect them to be as high once we were out in the bush and on the flat country runs. But uh, uh, for all intents and purposes and the calculations of what we needed where and, and, and how much, um, we used the, the, the figure of 40 gallons to the kilometre. Uh, with the coal too, it was 40 kilometres to the tonne. But as far as the water was concerned, the, the distances between available filling stops, if you like, was, was what depicted how much we had to carry with us at the time. For catering staff, the three-week return journey demanded much forward planning. Although most non-perishable food could be purchased prior to departure, perishable items had to be pre-ordered and collected en route at major town centres to ensure a constant supply of fresh food. All of our meals are generally handled by our catering manager, Moray, who plans what food will be required. Um, it's my responsibility to ensure that all of that is on the train. We only had one disaster on there, and it wasn't a disaster as it turned out, on the Alice Springs trip. The first morning that we'd, we left from Sydney, we'd planned to have Danish pastries for morning tea, and they weren't delivered. But, uh, because we'd had food on board, we rearranged the menu very quickly and served uh, something else to the passengers for morning tea on the first day. I uh, was requested by 3801 to go to uh, Alice Springs to uh, assist with the management of the locomotive. You see, once you're outside the metropolitan area, um, there are a lot of crews that have had no steam experience whatsoever, uh, and some, in fact, that have had steam experience, but on smaller locomotives in the 38 class. So myself and Stan Shaw, a fellow inspector from Wollongong, uh, it was our duty to uh, just supervise the crews and look after the uh, day-to-day -day running of the locomotive. Passengers on the Alice Springs trip were, were a great bunch. Uh, they all got on reasonably well together and it's like most tours where the first day people are very quiet but after, the, after they've been together a day they start to mix and get to know each other and uh, they work in very well and it, it's surprising uh, how much assistance the passengers are want to give you. I think overall people enjoy that sort of a trip where they can become involved. There was a lot of steam enthusiasts that made up the, the people that travel with us. Uh, there was people there that came from as far away as uh, New Zealand, Tasmania and Queensland. I guess they had to be fairly enthusiastic about steam to travel all that way. 
and um, and then there was the people that that were after an adventure and something different to the normal type holiday, and and that's probably why people got on so well because it was such a cross section of the of the community that, that they weren't all steam buffs and, and um, talking steam all the time. So there was there was a, a, just a great cross section. To go on the train, you had to have some affiliation with steam. I would imagine. Uh, wouldn't say I'm an enthusiast as far as going and travelling for miles and miles and miles behind the steam locomotive just for the novelty of it. And a lot of the people that were on the train, you could tell who the real enthusiasts were because they had goggles and every time you saw them they were hanging out windows and looking towards the loco and trying to capture the sound of the loco. And I quite often believe that a lot of the enthusiasts are people who are deprived in their childhood who didn't have very many steam train rides. Oh yes, I think uh, they're all eccentric. You've got to be crazy to want to do this sort of thing. I mean, who, well, there's plenty of easy ways to travel around to Alice Springs on a steam train for eight days. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, somebody said you don't have to be mad, but it helps. The train was followed by a fleet of three road coaches which ferried passengers and crew to pre-booked hotels and motels at each stopover. The cost of chartering the train all up was around the $250,000 mark. Uh, the cost just to hire the, the various state government tracks and, and employees to drive the train and guards ran out to just over $100,000. To organise a tour of that magnitude took uh, just over 12 months of planning uh, before we got to the real marketing stage. Um, basically seven days a week and most days probably 18 hours a day. That was just the organising that we had to do to, to put the actual tour side of the trip together. On top of that there was all the organising that 3801 did to get all their approvals and coal and water in place. And so it was, a, it was a mammoth job all told. Since the GAN was last hauled by steam power in the early 1950s, this was the first time Australian National Railways, managers of the Broken Hill Alice Springs line, allowed a steam train to travel this long distance unaccompanied by a diesel engine. It was also 3801's first visit to the Alice. We promised that uh, we would take the train to Alice Springs and we would not interfere with the traffic that that line uses uh, in any way and not cause any embarrassment to the authorities and um, we pulled it off. I think that was the most significant aspect of that whole trip. In terms of tools and equipment we, we know pretty much what we need to perform any job, whether it be on a bogey of a carriage uh, or whether it be having to remove uh, the coupling rods from the engine. We know the spanners that we need to do those jobs, so they all get heaved in, uh, either the crew van or in the toolboxes on the engine. Uh, we make ourselves a bit of a list, do we have this spanner, that spanner, uh, etc, and go from there. The other thing, of course, is all your lubricating oils, uh, the cylinder oil and the bearing oil, and, uh, of course, boiler water treatment, uh, which was a, a definite necessity because the South Australian water, and particularly the Alice Springs water, uh, is not real good at all. You don't even like to drink the stuff. You know, the poor old boiler suffers badly from the crook water. All the boiler water treatment does is uh, retain the impurities in the water. It, it keeps those dissolved solids in suspension uh, as opposed to the solids being baked onto the heating surfaces of the boiler. Those solids are removed by blowing the boiler down every day uh, on the trip, you know, invariably before we start and, and certainly when we finish at the end of the day's running. By blowing the boiler down, you open the blowdown valves and a great cloud of steam issues forth because the water's coming out at that 215 pounds per square inch pressure. As the water comes out, uh, so it carries the, uh, the, the uh, dissolved solids with it. And so we lower the dissolved solids content of the boiler water. And if you get a build up of solids uh, and
when you work the engine hard and subsequently the boiler, uh, the poor thing tends to froth and foam and bubble and carry on, and instead of having steam going over to your cylinders, you end up with a, a carryover of, of water and solids as well, and that's known as priming, which doesn't do the, the, the engine any good in terms of the, uh, the pistons and valves. At 7am, the train left Parks and headed for Broken Hill on the border of New South Wales and South Australia, a total distance of 675 kilometres. This was the longest leg of the journey, with the engine hauling 16 tonnes of coal and 29,000 gallons of water. Just outside of Condoblin we um, passed a, a, an accident site a couple of weeks before 3801 came through there was a, had been a level crossing accident there and of course the, the three uh, 80 class locomotives were still laying on their side. They tried to move them but it had been too wet and too boggy to get cranes in and uh, work successfully but I'm given to understand that uh, they were moving them shortly after we'd come through. On the Alice Springs trip we had uh, around 25 crew and after you've served 150 passengers and you're working in the kitchen you think well the day's work's almost over and then somebody says well what about the crew and you, you've got 25 more meals to go. Uh, at times the crew are very demanding in that uh, they think that they should be the first fed when in fact they're always the last. Um, the locomotive crew think that uh, you'll serve them a meal half an hour before you've got it ready or, you, or you'll still have it hot two hours after everyone else has finished their meal and it doesn't work that way and uh, there were some minor problems with, with people in that regard. This was also a day when those on board were able to appreciate firsthand the great contrast in Australian scenery. Green and straw-coloured fields dotted with farmhouses gave way to smooth sand dunes that merged to red dirt the nearer 3801 pushed towards Broken Hill. In terms of mechanical problems, uh, or indeed boiler problems as far as the trip was concerned, nothing major really occurred. The, the, the biggest disaster probably was uh, a poor unfortunate kangaroo going under the engine. And he was rolled around and bounced and what have you and came up under the little crew van. And when, he, when he came up a little bit too high, he happened to hit the branch pipe from the train pipe. Uh, and broke it off. And of course, that released all the air uh, in the train pipe. And subsequently, the brakes were applied on the whole of the train, so that brought it to a halt. So the, the leak was found because obviously it could be heard. The branch in the, uh, the brake pipe was plugged, so air pressure was restored to the, uh, the brake system, and they went on their merry way. That problem occurred on the run to Broken Hill, um, and was subsequently repaired so the carriage had its brakes back again, uh, whilst we were at Broken Hill. The day that we travelled from Parks to Broken Hill was the longest day of the journey, so we decided to take the people off the train at Menindi and give them a barbecue dinner at one of the local pubs. On board we had our own bush band, so we um, used them that night and they put on a, an impromptu uh, dance down at the pub, we got all the locals in. The publican decided it was too hard for him to handle, so he said, you take over the pub, and he said, and when you finish, just leave me the keys so I can lock up. So the whole town turned out, they were dancing on the bars and it was a, it was a big night, it was fairly hard to get most of the people out of the pub. <laughs> Thank 
On day four, the train stayed at Broken Hill, one of Australia's oldest mining towns. Surrounded with history, Broken Hill was an ideal stopover, giving passengers the opportunity to take coach tours around the local area. The additional tours were there just to break the journeys. We, we decided that ten days or eight days in a row was a little bit long for some people if they weren't steam enthusiasts to be sitting on a train every day. So to, to turn the trip into an actual tour as well as an adventure, we, um, we put these broken journeys in so that they could um, have a day away from the train. Some people chose to um, just wander around the town and not take the tours, but it was just a relaxing day for everybody. As far as checks were concerned during the trip, we uh, had a look under the engine at every opportunity that, that we could get. Um, certainly at, at parks uh, and again at Broken Hill where we could get the engine over a pit. We got underneath it and, and looked and poked and prodded and belted things to make sure you know, nuts and bolts etc are not working their way loose. You need to get under it and have a look because things do work loose. There's a lot of out of balance forces and, and the likes, uh, particularly when you're running at any great speed for any length of time. So, and, and the vibration uh, is pretty severe, so things can work loose. And they're just normal running checks that we carry out. So everywhere we were, overnight, virtually, if we couldn't get under the engine, we certainly went round it. Uh, with Parks, Broken Hill, Port Augusta, and certainly then in Alice Springs, you know, the, we, we, we did thorough inspections underneath the engine. After washing the locomotive and completing thorough maintenance checks, 19,000 gallons of water and 12 tonnes of coal were loaded in preparation for the 489 kilometre journey to Port Augusta. trip from Broken Hill to Port Augusta, we served breakfast on the platform prior to departure at uh, Broken Hill. Our crew were up at 4am that morning preparing breakfast. We served morning tea, uh, lunch, afternoon tea and a, a three course meal at night uh, prior to arriving in Port Augusta. The total of the, the three meals served that day was in the vicinity of 450. It was close to midnight that night before they got to their motels, so they were up from 4 a.m. till midnight uh, working, and uh, it was a very long day for the volunteers that day. I was uh, travelling overland uh, from Broken Hill down to Peterborough, having served breakfast to the passengers on the railway station at uh, Broken Hill. Um, the general manager, Tony Gogarty, and one or two others, we were asked to clean up and uh, uh, catch up with the train by bus and um, we'd uh, got down to uh, Manor Hill and um, we were waiting for the train to uh, come down. We saw it way in the distance coming down but uh, uh, Ian Thornton was uh, on the footplate at the time and recognising the general manager uh, waiting for the train he uh, clapped on speed and uh, left us completely stranded there so uh, fortunately uh, uh, the bus driver uh, hadn't yet gone and we managed to run down the road and, 
uh, attract his attention and caught up with the train down at Peterborough after a few grogs there at the local pub and uh, everything calmed in us and the general manager forgave him. The train had a two hour stopover at Peterborough before resuming the day's travel. The normal running maintenance that we carried out was, was uh, checks on oil consumption in the bearings and the, uh, the coupling rods, just to see how far we could go without having to add oil to the thing. Oil cup caps were removed at every opportunity to, uh, to see how the consumption would be. We didn't add any oil at all to the rods from Broken Hill to Port Augusta, and we still had ample left uh, in the bottom of the oil cup when we arrived at Port Augusta, so it was pretty good as far as the oil consumption was concerned. Most Australian locomotives were not designed to run any more than, say, 100 miles at a time without being serviced and oiled. But on the trip to Alice Springs, we, in fact, had to run longer distances than that. And that's why we pulled up on odd occasions. Uh, you'd see the passengers put their heads out the window and wonder what we were doing, but we were just checking oil levels and the like. The days travelling on the train were unlike normal train travel. We tried to organise entertainment for the people each day. We had bingo. There was talks on the history of the railway line and also talks on steam trains. There was uh, music by the band sometimes in the, the lounge area. People could uh, sit back and have a sleep if they weren't doing a, a quiet carriage. They could hang out a window and watch the steam train go up in front and get all the cinders in their eyes or, um, or go down to the bar and sit and have a quiet drink. So there was plenty for them to do and, and plenty of room for them to mix around. Following a two-day stopover at Port Augusta, the train set off once again on a 412-kilometre leg to Tarkula.
A distinct feature of South Australia is not only the wide open spaces, but the vivid contrasts in colour. Notably the driest state in the driest continent in the world, South Australia had recently enjoyed consistent rainfall. The spring wildflowers transformed the normally arid desolate outback with riotous bursts of colour. The contrast in the scenery was incredible and uh, we covered such an enormous distance and an enormous variety of countryside from the uh, Pacific Ocean all the way through the outback and all the way to the, the dead heart. It's a very rewarding business keeping this uh, bit of mobile heritage that uh, played such a major role in the development of the country and it's one of the very few that are left and it's uh, one of the very few that uh, can travel from one side of the Commonwealth right across to the other. At Takua, the uh, the ladies there had set up some stalls selling cakes and souvenirs and, and art craft works, the profits in aid of the Flying Doctor. They uh, occasionally get a train through that might pull up for a few minutes to, to get the next set of instructions from the, the local station master, but to have a train come in and stay overnight was just a novelty to them. Uh, they enjoyed it, they all came up to the, the hall where we had our dance here that night and, um, and the population of the town nearly tripled the night we were there. The organisation to, to set all the camping up was, was quite large just on its own. We had to take tents for uh, around 200 people. We had to take all the, the equipment to cater for them, um, breakfast and dinner. Going out into the, to the rural centre and the outback where there was no, uh, no accommodation suitable, places like Tarkula and Marla. So it was just a matter of, of um, forgetting it was a train trip and setting up like it was a camping tour and um, getting the tents out, showing the people how to put them up and that was a novelty in itself, watching people put up a tent which was rather simple, four pegs and a pole, um, but some people make it look fairly difficult. We ran coaches alongside to transfer the people each night and to carry all their luggage so that people didn't have to carry their suitcase onto the train each morning and then off each afternoon. Drivers of the coaches then had to pack up the whole camp and all the, the cooking equipment and then try and be in Marla before the train got there which was a fairly hard task and they were probably about ten minutes late getting there. The journey from Tarkula to Mala covered a distance of 408 kilometres and, as each kilometre passed, the terrain became increasingly desolate. The 38 class was designed as an express passenger locomotive and uh, they performed very well in New South Wales in that capacity, but when we went to Alice Springs with the wide open country... ...two water tankers for us at Mala. But we had a little bit of a problem at Mala. It was the only time we had a hiccup. We couldn't get our pumps to, to connect onto the, uh, the water tank outlets. So uh, with much confusion and, and thinking and, and, and indeed a lot of swearing, we ended up with the wheelbarrow under the outlet of one of the water tanks and the suction hose from the pumps into the wheelbarrow. Uh, mind you, it worked quite well, much to everyone's delight and a lot of amusement from the passengers. Uh, in a lot of areas, the the old steam locomotive servicing facilities are gone. We've got to improvise these days and cart gear with us and that, that seems to uh, extend the servicing time beyond what it used to be. It's a lot of work being on the steam locomotive but you get a lot of satisfaction out of it. It's certainly more interesting than being there on a diesel. 
Of course, one of the things that people don't see is the fact that uh, the servicing time involved in getting a locomotive ready after it had been stabled for the night. Uh, if a train was due away at, say, 7 a.m. in the morning, that meant a 4 a.m. start for uh, the cruise. So they had three hours' work in before the train even left. Following another night camping under the Outback Stars, the train departed on the last leg of its journey, a 426 kilometre trek across the border into the Northern Territory and on towards Alice Springs. One of the uh, things that sticks in my mind about the trip to Alice Springs was the, the number of times that you'd see kids and mums and dads appear out of the scrub and wave to the trains that went past and then just disappear again, never see them again. Uh, that was apart from the people that turned up at little isolated uh, villages and overseas. Just as we get a great thrill out of uh, uh, seeing this wonderful train uh, chuffing around the countryside, well. They come for hundreds and hundreds of miles just to relive a few moments as we go flying through the junctions and railway stations. The satisfaction I get from working with the company, it really is seeing kids' faces. They've seen Thomas the Tank Engine on television, but uh, 3801, certainly not Thomas. The noises are different, just the, the loco itself is different, the train's different, and, and young kids, uh, we have I get my satisfaction is just seeing their faces when they see something that's not commonly seen today. 3801 is our favourite engine. The uh, 38 class was the epitome of uh, steam locomotive design as far as uh, Australia was concerned. It's a spoilt child now, it's the last one that's left and uh, a lot of care and attention lavished upon it uh, by the mechanical people and uh, it's the biggest uh, attraction as far as steam engines are concerned, particularly in Australia. It, uh, it's the only one that's travelled uh, into every state and every capital city and uh, it just uh, attracts tremendous attention wherever it goes. I think the tours were secondary to the, the actual train trip. A lot of people had been out there before. Uh, there were some that, that kept on going once they got to Alice Springs and, and explored the whole area quite extensively, but their main reason for going was, was to be on the steam train. And uh, the general feeling of the people after being together for 10 days was one of, of being a great big happy family. And uh, I'd be very surprised if a lot of people aren't still in contact with people they met on the train and a lot have indicated to me that they would like to know when the next one is because they all want to go again. Thirty eight oh one would be one of the better locomotives that I've worked on. I've worked on all types and shapes and sizes of locomotives, but the thirty eight class is possibly the most re responsive of them. It's a really a lovely machine to work on. Most of the Australian National Railways crews were most impressed with the locomotive and its performance. They, they couldn't get over a locomotive performing like it did. Uh, of course, what you should remember is that on Australian National, there's been really uh, no uh, major steam operations there since the early 50s. But on this occasion, we were lucky that the drivers provided to us by Australian National were uh, old steam men and it's like learning to swim. Once you can swim, uh, you can keep on doing it, perhaps not as far as you used to. One of the things that uh, I did notice was that whilst the crews had to adapt to our locomotives, we as loco inspectors had to adapt to their operating conditions, and it was quite an interesting experience for all concerned. Seeing the thing run, and, and run successfully, is uh, a tremendous uh, satisfaction uh, to myself and indeed everybody else. 
riding the engine is a thrill, there's no doubt about that. Having a little fire every now and then, that's not too bad either. Uh, and, and, you know, just being on the thing and listening to it work, and particularly when it's, when it's in a slog up a hill, uh, you listen to the thing, you hear the, the, the exhaust beat, uh, and you listen for any oddball thumps that might be around to tell you that something's going to go wrong or something needs uh, attention. That doesn't happen very often, fortunately. But no, it's, it's, it's a job with a difference, uh, and indeed one that's uh, very satisfying, albeit at times bloody hard and there's some damn long hours in it. Ten days after leaving Sydney, 3801 steamed into Alice Springs, having consumed more than 60 tonnes of coal and 100,000 gallons of water. The thing that uh, I enjoyed about the trip was uh, taking the 38 class to Alice Springs to see a 38 class uh, in 1992 sitting up in the Alice Springs platform and the work involved in getting it there was quite a challenge and uh, a job well done, I considered. At, at Alice Springs we were there for five days and uh, after a couple of days the engine had cooled down sufficiently uh, to allow us to, to clean the accumulated ashes and cinders out of the firebox and smoke box uh, and we then washed the boiler out this uh, entailed using high pressure hoses and you actually take all the plugs out of the boiler and drain the stale water out and then you wash out the accumulated mud and sediment. The amount of mud and sediment you get depends entirely on the type of water you're using and, and of course as the further we got away from the coast the, uh, the worse the water was and we found at Alice Springs that uh, uh, the boiler was in fact quite dirty. Of course, in the old days, uh, loco boilers were washed out on a regular basis. In some depots, they washed them out every two or three days, and in some depots, they washed them out every week, depending again on the type of work and type of water available. After a five-day break, and having added another first to its 50-year career, 3801 hauled its train out of the Alice, beginning a 3,000 kilometre return journey across half a continent to its home in Sydney. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Although that was pretty reasonable. Patrick Moore tells how Britain.